It's hard to remain enemies when you've broken bread together. In many Western countries, bread is a staple part of any meal. But what kind of bread are we eating? In this podcast, you'll learn about many different types of bread and some idioms with the word bread. Welcome to Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. Hello, my name's Craig. And my name's Reza. And with nearly 50 years of teaching between us, Reza and I will help you improve your English and take it to the next level. How are you? I'm doing well, Craig. And you? It's really good to see you. I'm happy to be podcasting with you again. You look wonderful today. I think so do you. I'm really, I'm really jealous of Craig's t-shirt, by the way. He's got a t-shirt saying how proud he is to be grumpy. And as a professional grump myself, as I've been told many times, uh, I'm very jealous of your t-shirt. Where can I get that? What does grumpy mean? Grumpy is gruñón. Yeah, someone who's always complaining about things. Oh, don't like this. This could be better. That, that's me. So I, I, if I could get my hands on one of those t-shirts, I'd love one. By the way, if you're feeling a bit grumpy because maybe you don't have a job at the moment, keep listening to the end of the podcast because we have a job offer that you might be interested in. So if you're in the job market, as they say, make sure you listen right to the end of today's episode. Well, I don't think we're feeling grumpy today. We're feeling quite good. And partly because of a voice message we've received from our friend Felix from Venezuela. Hello, Reza. Hello, Craig. And this is Felix from Venezuela. This is my first time recording an audio message to you. And I'm doing this because I want to thank you. Thank you for all your job. You don't have idea how helpful you are. I have to say that I've been listening to you for a quite long time. And since I've been listening to you, my English improved a lot. Another thing is that I previously listened to your podcast about Venezuela. And I'm glad that my country were, were a topic for your podcast. And you were all right in several things well and this is all i do have to say thank you and i'll be listening to you bye thank you very much felix for sending in your message it's really good to hear from a first time caller so well done on recording a voice message and practicing your english which is very very good i really thought your pronunciation was good reza any comments Thanks very much, Felix. So your first message, but you've listened to many episodes. Maybe you, you could become an alcoholic. That's, remember, A-I-R-C-K, not someone who drinks too much alcohol, but someone who listens to too many of our podcasts. We'd love you to become an alcoholic. Your message was fantastic, wasn't it, Craig? It was very good. And you used the present perfect continuous with listen very well. I've been listening to you. In fact, you used the verb listen four times and three times with the preposition to, but just once you forgot, you said, I listened your podcast about Venezuela. So not really for you, Felix, because I'm sure you know you need to after listen. You listen to something. But for everyone else listening, please remember it's a common mistake that we hear many times. You need to after listen. You listen to something. And another small thing, Felix, you said, I'm glad that my country were a topic. I like the way you use glad instead of happy. You're varying your vocabulary. Well done. But topic is singular. So was a topic. I'm glad that my country was a topic. One more little thing. I think you said, Felix, but I'm not sure because of the audio, it might be the quality. I think you said, my English improved. But it would be better to say, my English has improved. Because you're talking about something that started in the past and it's relevant now. So it's better to use a present perfect. My English has improved. 
Felix is from Venezuela and he was speaking about an episode of the podcast we created about the country of Venezuela. If you want to listen to that and see a picture of me on a donkey in Venezuela, go to inglespodcast.com slash 349. Craig, I was born and bred in Belfast. What about you? I was born and bred in London, but that's not bread that you eat, is it, when you say born and bred? What does that mean? Well, I was born in Belfast. My mother gave birth to me, but I was never a piece of bread. <laughs> no, I wasn't a piece of bread or any type of bread. Uh, the word bread there was to breed, B-R-E-E-D, is an irregular verb, breed, bread, bread. And it happens to be exactly the same pronunciation of our word, B-R-E-A-D, pan, also bread. And bread, B-R-E-A-D, the food, is usually used as a noun, and it's usually used as an uncountable noun. I say usually because today in this episode, we're speaking about different types of bread. So I can say there are different breads available. In the same way that cheese is usually uncountable when you speak about the substance of cheese, but there are many cheeses, so it can be plural. There are many meats, so you can use some nouns that are usually uncountable as countable nouns. So, since I was born at a time when it was very possible, I was born and bred, I could say, that was a nati y fue criado, bread, remember? I was born and bred, above all, on white bread. Me too. White bread was my staple. I was born and bred in it. I was brought up. I was bred on white bread. <laughs> Sorry for that joke. But it wouldn't be my favourite type now. There are many other types of bread, aren't there, Craig? Yeah, there are. Just one quick question before we look at these different types of bread. When you were growing up, you probably had bread that was pre-cut into slices. And if you speak Spanish, you might say pan de molde. You can buy it in supermarkets. It's already cut. Did your mum call it sliced bread or cut bread? My mum called it cut bread. I always had cut bread sandwiches. Just to confuse you a bit more, my mum called it something else. I think it's a typical Irish thing. My mum called it pan loaf. That's right. Really? P -A -N, pan. You heard it right. And you'll find it in the dictionary. There is an English word, P-A-N, which refers to bread, pan, pan loaf. In Ireland, a pan loaf means processed sliced bread. Maybe baked in a pan. And that's where it's no, from? No, no, no. That's not where it comes from. I'm not sure where it comes from, but many people in Ireland say pan loaf and they mean your pan bimbo, pan de molde. What about that? That's, that's thrown you, hasn't it? It has. That's interesting. I'd never heard that expression before. D don't say it anywhere else. People probably won't understand you. But in Ireland, they will. If you ask for just pan, they won't understand. But if you ask for a pan loaf, they'll know that you want sliced bread. Okay. One more thing about pan de molde or cut bread, sliced bread. I've tried it in Spain a few times. There's a make of bread called bimbo and I find it sweeter than I remember it when I was growing up in the UK and I don't like the sliced white bread in Spain. It's not at all like the bread I remember when I was growing up. I think virtually, no, virtually no. Every single giri, gringo, foreigner I've ever met in Spain says exactly the same as you, Craig. Exactly the same. I think there's an explanation for it. I think years ago, perhaps less now, white processed bread, sliced bread, pan bimbo, pan de molde, was designed really for kids in Spain. Yeah. In the UK, no. It's for adults, kids, who anybody wants, pensioners. But I think in Spain, it was originally intended really for kids. It's child. It's a child's food. So they put more sugar in it, made it sweeter. Yeah, simple as that. Not many adults ate it when I first arrived in Spain, except in un sandwich, as, you know, the Spanish toasted one. But for, you know, just a, just like on its own or, you know, untoasted was not common at all. But there is another kind of bread which is not white and it's brown. It's brown bread. That is what you would say in, in English, brown bread. If you speak Spanish, pan indigrar, it can also be called wholemeal bread or whole wheat bread. We'd write those as one word, wholemeal 
M-E-A-L, or whole wheat. Now, all of these types of breads are listed on our website. You can see the list of vocabulary at inglespodcast.com slash 359. What other kind of breads are there? Well, just to clarify, Craig said whole wheat bread. But if I just say wheat bread and I leave out the word whole, that's pan de trigo. So wheat is trigo, wheat bread. But by adding whole, whole means entero, whole wheat, integral. Yeah, the whole thing, integral, if you like. So integral. You can also say whole grain, G-R-A-I-N, which means the same as whole wheat, el trigo, integral. When you buy bread, you don't usually buy bread in pieces or slices. You buy it complete, which is a loaf of bread, L-O-A-F, which in Spanish might be hogaza or barra de pan, a loaf of bread. Listen to the pronunciation because we don't pronounce each word separately in English. We've said that many times. We don't say a loaf of bread, we say a loaf of bread, a loaf of, a loaf of bread. And the same for rebanada, we would pronounce it a slice of bread. So get used to hearing those words all mixed up together in fast speech. Of course, there are many things you can do with a slice of bread. You could toast it, T-O-A-S-T, tostar. You could probably guess that word, but you might not guess that the word toast in English is uncountable because it's countable in Spanish. You can say, dame una tostada, dame dos tostadas. In English, you cannot say two toasts, three toasts, a toast. You can't say that. It's uncountable. So you have to say a slice of toast or some people say also a piece of toast. Another word connected to bread and a pet hate of mine is crumbs, C R U. M-B-S, in Spanish, migas, or migajas. Now, what do you mean by it's a pet hate of yours, Craig? A pet hate is something that really bothers me, that really annoys me. When I see crumbs on the tablecloth, or if I cut bread into slices, and there are crumbs in the kitchen, if I don't clean them, they annoy me. It really annoys me. Putting something on the table when there are crumbs on the table, really bothers me. I don't know why. Maybe that's from growing up and my mum being quite clean around the house. I don't know. But it still bothers me today. Crumbs everywhere. For me, not so much in the kitchen, but on the table, it bothers me as well. I don't like crumbs on the table before I eat. Fair enough if they're as a result of the meal, but I want them cleared before I eat. I, I share that pet hate of yours. But no, I have to, it's almost an obsession. I have to clean the crumbs immediately after eating. I can't <laughs> leave them on the table. It really bothers me. I don't know why. Craig, uh, one thing which we'll include in, in, in bread, although probably strictly speaking it isn't, is a nice croissant. Do you like croissants? I do, but in my opinion, I don't know if you'll agree, they don't tend to be very good in Spain. Now, if you've eaten French croissants, and Dominique and Pilar and other listeners in France will know what I'm saying here, French croissants have got to be the best. And very often in Spanish bars, they're not the same. They're usually harder, they're not so soft, and I don't think they're made with butter. Sometimes nowadays they are, but when we first came, it was virtually impossible, wasn't it, to get a butter yeah. croissant. They used lard in some cases. L-A-R-D. Lard is manteca, and that's not what you're supposed to put in, in croissants. Or probably some horrible cheap oil. It's got to be butter. Come on, come on. Spanish uh, bakers, get your act together. That means make an effort. Although we, we, we're saying Spain, but maybe it's a Valencian thing. Maybe it's this region where we live. The croissants, generally speaking, are not very good. Maybe if you travel to other parts of Spain, you can find good croissants, especially in the north. Well, you, you might be right, although there is one thing which is fairly universal in Spain. The quality may be particularly bad in this area, 
but they've got that obsession with painting them with sh- that sugary liquid. Yeah. Uh, they, and you don't always do that in Spain, but often you get a sugary solution and you paint that. They never do that in France. That's not a croissant. Yeah, you can do other things. You can put chocolate on it and all, but you don't put that sugary, horrible liquid that no. comes hard and sticky. I've only ever seen that in Spain and I do not like it, I have to say. I share Craig's uh, disapproval. Uh, it's definitely not my cup of tea. Oh, by the way, one thing. We spell croissant the same as the French because we got it from them. Uh, C-R-O-I-S-S-A-N-T. That's the only way to spell it in English. I've seen about four variations in Spanish. Have you? Yeah, yeah. Nobody in Spain knows exactly how it's spelled. They keep changing their mind. And because it's a French word and because I'm used to saying it when I speak English in England, in other countries, when I say in Spain, I get the pronunciation wrong very often. And I say un café con leche and un croissant. And they don't understand because they can pronounce it different ways. So it's confusing. I make an effort. I go out of my way. That means make an effort to say it badly in Spain to How be understood. So when I'm in Spain, I say, un café con leche, un croissant. Croissant. Oh, like un croissant. <laughs> Sometimes I say croissant, whatever. But I know if I say croissant, no one's going to understand me. Forget that. You won't get anywhere. Another type of bread is rye bread, R-Y-E, pan de centeno. And this kind of bread can be light or medium or dark in colour, depending on which part of the rye berry you use to make the flour. Flour, of course, is harina in Spanish. And this kind of bread, rye bread, is very popular in the U.S., You often go into delicatessens, into delis, and say pastrami on rye, for example, and they give you a lovely rye bread sandwich with pickles and meat inside. Craig, did you just mention flowers or flour? Well, for me, it's the same pronunciation. Flower in the garden, F-L-O-W-E-R, and flour to make bread, harina, F-L-O-U-R is exactly the same pronunciation in the south of England. Flower. Do you say it differently? I do, but I, and of course I was just teasing. I was just making fun. I knew exactly what you were talking about from the context. But a lot of English speakers, in fact, the majority don't pronounce it that way. Let's see if it works. In an American accent, I might say, I need flour to make my bread. And, oh, the garden's full of lovely flowers. It's definitely different. So you're emphasizing the R sound on flower. Yeah, and I would say that there's more of a distinction that there are two syllables, flower, whereas the arena is flower. Okay, so it's a very soft R, isn't it? Flower. And it kind of joins (laughs) into one. Well, no, it's not soft, but it's like, it's almost like one syllable, flower, whereas the el flor is flower. Like, yes. uh, a slight, there's, a, there's a slight difference for me being Irish and for Americans as well, I'm sure, and Scottish and a few others. But yeah, I know in Oxford English, it's the same pronunciation. Another type of bread from Germany is pumpernickel. Lovely word to say, pumpernickel. Pumpernickel bread. It's a type of rye bread. Have you tried pumpernickel? I think I have. I'm not sure. Is it that really heavy bread? Yes. Yeah. And it, dark, very dark in colour, I think. So, yeah, dark rye bread. Yeah. One small slice of it because it's very filling is what I would I could eat, but I wouldn't have it often. And it doesn't tend to be soft. It, it's usually quite hard. Maybe that's that's one reason I don't like it. I like very fresh, soft bread that's crusty on the outside. Crusty is hard and crunchy. <laughs> when you bite it. So that's how I like my bread. Do you like multigrain bread? Yes, I do. We can get multigrain bread in my local supermarket, multicereales in Spanish. But um, how is it made? What kind of grains are in that bread? It depends. There's, there's all different types. You can put in flax is a common one. Flax is the seed which gives us linen, the material. So flax is lino. In Spanish, oats, avena, barley, zabada, and lots of other grains, but those would be the most commonly found in 
multigrain bread. I know there's one kind of bread that's very close to home from you and very popular where you grew up. That's soda bread. What's soda bread? Yes, that's an absolute essential in Irish cuisine, a very staple, a basic part of the diet. It's an Irish bread made from wheat flour and something called buttermilk. Buttermilk is what you might call in Spanish suero, the mantequilla. So it's not butter and it's not milk, but if you imagine making butter the old-fashioned traditional way, when the butter is made, after you move it around, the liquid that's left, the liquid which doesn't become butter, that's buttermilk. And apparently it's very, very good for you. It's very, very healthy. It has a strong taste. Would you say, Craig, a slightly, a slightly sour taste? Yeah, and it's very common in some cake recipes. Uh, my wife loves baking and she makes cakes with buttermilk and it's not easy to find in Spain. You have to go to uh, German supermarkets here to find buttermilk. It's not a common ingredient in Spanish cuisine. We'll, we'll give a, a little bit of free publicity, but only in the interest in, of cultural, cultural awareness. You can get it in Aldi and you can, I, I don't know if, Maybe it says suero de mantequilla or buttermilk. You can see it in the German. It's very similar. Buttermilk. Buttermilk or something like that. (laughs) So uh, it's fairly popular in Germany as well. And the last ingredient, by the way, in soda bread is baking soda. uh, Bicarbonato, bicarbonate. So that's why we call it soda bread. Another popular type of bread in Ireland and also in Scotland and England is potato bread. And you've written two words here that I haven't heard of, Reza. One is farl, F-A-R-L, and one is tatty bread, T-A-T-T-Y, which I'm guessing is another name for potato, tatty? You've said it the Scottish way. Yes. The Scots say tatty bread, and uh, in Ireland, or certainly in the north of Ireland, which is where it's most popular, we say titty bread. Ah, okay. Yeah, so Scottish tatty bread, Irish tatty bread. And the word farl, it comes from an old English word, or it's related to an old English word, which is fardel, but you won't hear that in modern English. And it meant a fourth, a, a quarter, because the traditional way to make potato farls is a round, more or less round, flat thing, which you cut into four pieces, and each one is the farl. And that's the traditional way you see it today. So it's kind of like, if you can imagine, two sides are straight and the other side is is curved. That's your far. I remember seeing that when we were in Ireland, yes. So it's it's a classic. That's the typical format for teddy bread, as people say in the north of Ireland. So when you make bread, most bread, you need flour, as we mentioned, and water, maybe some salt. And when you mix the ingredients together, you get a substance called dough. Now, the spelling might confuse you. D-O-U-G-H. The pronunciation is dough. The same vowel sound as no or go or throw, etc. Dough. And dough, if you speak Spanish, is the masa. So that's why in English we say For the masa madre, we say sour dough bread. So dough, masa, sour agrio. The masa agrio. So sour dough is masa madre in English. By the way, to digress for a second, dough is also a colloquial slang word for money. Where you might say pasta in Spanish, you can say dough to mean money. I have no dough on me. I have no money. A word that you will know, because it's exactly the same in Spanish, but with different pronunciation perhaps, is doughnut. Think about that. Dough, masa, and nut. Now, we don't mean fruto seco. That's one meaning of nut. And we don't mean un loco. That's another meaning of nut. (laughs) But nut can be something round, which goes around a bolt. A bolt is like a screw, un tornillo. And if you get something round which screws around that, that is a nut. Nuts and bolts is a common collocation. So that's why we call it a doughnut, because it's round, like this metallic round thing that you put around um, a bolt. So that's why we say doughnut in English. And you've copied the word from Spanish. Notice that the Americans, although they spell the word dough the same as us, 
when it's donut, they write D-O-N-U-T. Whereas in British English, we write D-O-U-G-H-N-U-T. If you're an optimist, you see the donut. If you're a pessimist, you see the hole. <laughs> Speaking of America, hamburger and hot dogs usually are served in a bun or a bap, pieces of bread that don't really have a lot of taste because the focus is what's inside the bread, the hamburger or the hot dog. So a hot dog bun, B-U-N, or BAP, B-A-P. Something similar to a hamburger, hot dog, bun or BAP is a bread roll. Or sometimes we just say roll, if the context is obvious. And that would be a panathillo, so a little, much smaller than a loaf of bread, for example. One of my favorite things in life, one of life's little pleasures, is French bread with brie cheese in France. Beautiful French bread, or you can say a French stick, S-T-I-C-K. In Spanish, that would be um, baguette, or well, that's a French word, baguette, or baton. So French bread is the long bread that you can buy in many supermarkets. Another French word which uh, we use in the world of bread is brioche, B-R-I-O-C-H-E. I think they're beginning to become quite popular now in Spain. They're a sweet yeast bread with eggs and butter. This word yeast, Y-E-A-S-T, means levadura. So brioche has yeast and a lot of sugar with eggs and butter. So sweeter than normal bread, let's say. I was quite disappointed because I thought that before the French Revolution, that was a quote from Marie Antoinette. She said, let them eat cake. If they're too poor to eat or buy bread, let them eat cake. And that sparked off or started the French Revolution. And when I checked that on the internet this morning, apparently she never said it. It's not. It's a false quotation. The translation into French will be brioche, because brioche is kind of the cake, cakey kind of bread. Staying with foreign languages, but another one, a different one, Italian, gives us the word, uh, forgive me my pronunciation at any Italian listeners, ciabatta, C-I-A-B-A-T-T-A, ciabatta, and apparently it means slipper. I didn't know that. Yeah, in Italian it means slipper. Slipper being that thing you wear on your foot at home. Zapatilla de estar brocasa, they say here in Valencia. Slipper, so Chiabat is a slipper. Funny. And there's another f very famous Italian bread. And again, forgive me how Italian listeners for my pronunciation, focaccia. Is that how you would say it? Focaccia? Yeah, I think you say it better than me. <laughs> focaccia. Flat yeast bread, which is kind of similar to pizza dough. There's that word again, dough, pizza dough. And on the top, there's olive oil and rosemary. Rosemary, if you're a Spanish speaker, is romero and some salt. So it's quite a salty bread, which is very, very good. So, so far we've mentioned different types of bread. We mentioned wheat bread, uh, wholemeal and, and white. We've mentioned uh, rye bread, multigrains. We've even mentioned potato bread. Here's another one, corn bread. Not so common in Spain or indeed in Britain in or the, Ireland. In the West. In the West in general. But I imagine for South American listeners, I imagine you eat a lot more corn bread there, pan de maíz. So obviously it has corn and usually also wheat flour, eggs and milk or possibly buttermilk. And it's also very popular in the southern United States. And I'm guessing arepas is a type of cornbread, isn't it? Yeah, I guess in, in America, in the United States, when they say cornbread, they're talking about a very specific type. But I guess you could say also there are many types of cornbread, breads made out of corn. For example, we all know, hopefully, that Mexico is famous for its, its tortillas, which is a type of cornbread. By the way, Craig, have you noticed that it's much harder to get 
tortillas made out of corn in Spain than made out of wheat. Have yeah, that? yeah, I've noticed that. Yeah, it's strange. I wonder why. But Mexican listeners, please confirm for me that in Mexico you wouldn't dream of using wheat tortilla for your fajitas, etc. No way. The authentic recipe is definitely with corn. I have a sneaky, cynical feeling. What does sneaky mean? Sneaky means it's at suspicious. the back of my mind. Suspicious. Yeah. Uh, a bit cynical that corn, bre- corn tortillas, sorry, are more difficult to find simply because corn's more expensive to make the bread out of. So <laughs> whether you like it or not, the 80% or wheat, it's as simple as that. So I'm, I bet our, our Mexican listeners are horrified, but you'll have to investigate quite hard to get your corn tortillas here in Valencia. When you're watching sports on TV and you're drinking your beer with your friends, all over the world, I think it's fairly common to eat pretzels. P-R-E-T-Z-E-L, a salty snack that is wheat-based, I believe, and goes very well with beer when you're watching TV. I identify pretzels above all with the United States. Yeah, me too. And that certain type of cornbread we mentioned as well. And another thing from America is bagel, or I identify it with with America. Bagel, B-A-G-E-L. Yeah, you pronounce it differently in Spanish. In English, it's bagel. And I understand that it's a round thing, a bit like a donut, but I believe that proper bagels, which are very hard to find outside the United States are actually made in water. Is that right? Well, first they're boiled and then they're baked. That's why they're a bit different. And you can get all kinds of bagels. My favourite is the plain bagel with nothing, just the bread. But you can get onion bagels and poppy seed bagels and all kinds of bagels, especially in the US. Bagel, I believe, is a typical or it's originally a typical Jewish bread. And another one is matzo. M-A-T-Z-O, something which you find in Europe, but it's probably much easier to find in the United States. And we would describe that as unleavened bread. That means without yeast. Think about it. The Spanish word for yeast is levadura. Unleavened means without yeast in it. So it's an unleavened flat bread, matzo. So flat breads are breads that haven't risen they don't have a lot of air inside and other flat breads include pita bread p-i-t-a which is very common in asia and the middle east and another flat bread is naan n-a-a-n n-a-a-n from india predominantly and of course tortilla I'd like to mention a couple of other things which are not so well known here I'm going to make a special note of my admiration for Valencian bakers. Now, Craig and I in this episode have criticised, we've criticised the croissants you get in Valencia. They tend to be awful. Yes. And we're not going to change them. Not not always, but often. But they tend to be, yeah, not always. So, here comes the good bit for Valencians, the applause. Traditional Valencian rosquilletas, they can be spectacularly good. They are the unsung hero. That means they're a hero, but they don't get the credit of Spanish cuisine, if you ask me. And they've got to be Valencian. That's right. They're not so famous in the rest of Spain. It's got to be from Valencia. They are so much better. They're miles better than that horrible, crappy, mass-produced stuff you get in supermarkets, which, sorry, a a few listeners tend to be French or Italian, Grissini or Brezzi. No, no, no. The Valencian Rosquieta is a much superior product. Would you agree, Craig? I would agree totally. And having sung the praises of Valencia Roscayetas, to sing the praises means to appreciate very much and compliment. I think we should also compliment some English baking. And although England doesn't have a fantastic reputation for cooking, two things we do recommend is the English muffin, M-U-F-F-I-N, which is a round savoury, which is salado in Spanish, a savoury type of bread, which is very often sliced in two, parted in the middle, and then toasted and buttered. Now, don't confuse the English muffin 
with American muffins or other muffins which tend to be sweet. So the English muffin is savoury, put some butter on it, absolutely lovely. And there's another thing we can butter, isn't there, Reza, that's English? Yes, and remember I'm Irish, eh? A Craig's English, but I am a huge fan of English muffins and even bigger fan of crumpets. An English crumpet is a fantastic thing. What is it? It's a traditional thick, flat, round, and this is the important bit. It's porous. Porous. It has pores in it. P-O-R-O-U-S. But like holes. Holes, basically, yeah. But they don't go right the way through. Yeah, they don't go through one end and out the other. No. And it's savoury and it's yeasty. And it's usually eaten like the muffin, toasted, with butter. And the butter must be added when it's still warm so it melts, fundir, through those pores. So if you were to squash it, the the butter would maybe like kind of jump out of the holes, right? It's <laughs> the most delicious thing ever, isn't it, Craig? Well, it depends how much butter you put on a crumpet. And apart from Reza's tip about putting butter on a hot crumpet so that it melts, also use good quality butter. It must be good quality butter, which Reza will tell you is Irish butter. Very, very good. Now, we've given you quite a lot of straight vocabulary. Straight, meaning... What you see is what it is. What about some idioms when the words don't have their normal meaning? Now, right at the beginning of the show, Craig began with one in this episode. He said, to break bread with someone. What did you really mean by that, Craig? Well, it's an expression from the Bible. If you break bread with someone, that means you're sharing your food with them. Now, obviously, you can't do that with someone you don't like or you don't get on well with. If you're sharing your food you have, you're breaking your bread, then you are offering them something that's very, very valuable, especially in the days of the Bible when food was not everywhere. It wasn't easy to get food sometimes. So to break bread with someone means to have a meal with them. And it's used these days as an idiom to eat together and share good food with friends. If you really like something in English, particularly if it's a new thing or a really useful invention, people often say it's the best thing since sliced bread or the greatest thing since sliced bread. So I guess when sliced bread was invented, that was a very, very uh, useful advance in human progress. So this is a, a something that you really admire. The greatest thing since sliced bread. When you bake bread in the oven, the outside of the bread is hard and the adjective for describing it is crusty, crujiente in Spanish. The noun of crusty is crust, so the crust is on the outside of the bread. But if I said upper crust, Reza, what do you understand from that? The upper crust of society. Oh, that's nobility, aristocracy, high class, posh people. People like that are the upper crust. We mentioned crumbs before, migas in Spanish, but the expression, oh, crumbs, you could say instead of swearing, instead of saying a bad word. Imagine you spill the wine on the table or you, you have an accident, you break something. Oh, oh, crumbs, which means, oh, dear, or whoops, I didn't mean to do that. So it's an expression of feeling kind of sorry or maybe using it if you don't want to swear or say a bad word in English. Oh, crumbs. Now, if you're from the upper crust, you definitely live above the bread line. But if you live below the bread line, that means you have trouble surviving because you don't have enough money. So above the bread line, you've got enough to eat and survive. Below the bread line, you don't. And I guess we use the word bread with line because we think of bread as like the most basic thing you can eat. There's nothing more basic and it's usually cheap as well than bread. So if you're below the bread line, you, you don't even have enough to eat. We've mentioned butter before. Of course, bread goes very well with butter. You put butter on your bread. But if you speak about your bread and butter in the idiomatic sense, you're meaning it's the basics, the, the bare minimum that you need. 
Let me give you an example. Sometimes as teachers, we do work that's not teaching. We might do maybe some correction or maybe some examining work and we earn some money doing things like that occasionally. But that's not where our main salary comes from. It's not our bread and butter. So your main income, you could say, is your bread and butter. It's what puts food on the table. The main thing is the bread and butter. Another idiom with bread and butter is to say he knows what side his bread's buttered. His bread is buttered. Yeah, he knows what side his bread's buttered. And that idiom means that he knows, he has a definite opinion about something. He knows where he stands. He's uh, very, very clear about something. We've spoken in the past about rhyming slang that you can use, particularly in the south of England. And one expression is brown bread. One word that rhymes with bread is dead. So if you hear someone say to you, um, yeah, uh, Tom, he's, he's not with us anymore. He's brown bread. That means he's passed away. He's dead. In Northern Ireland, you have a different expression, don't you? Yeah, you, you, we'd only know this if you visited there. Since we eat a lot of potato bread there, we say teddy bread. So it's in Northern Ireland, if somebody's dead, oh, God bless him, he's teddy bread. He's brown bread, he's dead. <laughs> Obviously, you bake bread in the oven, and when bread's ready, you remove it. But if you remove it before it's ready, you could say it's half-baked. Now, that can also be used idiomatically when you describe an idea, for example, a half-baked idea. What does that mean? Well, it's not an idea that has been thought about thoroughly. You haven't thought it through. So you do things quickly. You do it without thinking. It's a half-baked idea. Now, bread is a very important part of most people's diet around the world. But, you know, man cannot live by bread alone. Or some people say, a man does not live by bread alone. What do you understand by that, Craig? It means you need to give life meaning. I think it's from the Bible. Yes, you need to eat. You need to be warm. You need to have shelter and a roof over your head. But sometimes you need more in life. You need some spirituality, for example. You need some meaning, a reason to get up in the morning. So man does not live by bread alone. You need something more than just food and sustenance. And now it's your turn to practice your English. We would love to hear from you. If you have a comment, a question about English, a doubt, anything, please get in touch. We prefer a voice message. You can send us a message by going to speakpipe.com. That's S-P-E-A-K-P-I-P-E dot -E com slash English podcast. Emails, Reza? If you want to write, you could get Craig on his email at craig at englishpodcast.com or me, belfastreza at gmail.com. If you're interested in paying for an English course to improve your English, go to store, S-T-O-R-E dot mansioningles dot net, where you'll find some courses on the Mansion Ingles website. Thank you to all of you who are helping us by supporting this podcast on the Patreon scheme. If you would like to join our Patreon program for as little as $1.20 per month, that's including the VAT tax, you get instant access to recent transcriptions. To find out more about that, go to patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash English podcast. We like to thank our Patreon sponsors in every episode and we'd love to say everybody's name, but unfortunately we haven't got time. But we do like to mention our most recent, our new supporters. And they are, well, the first one we don't know, no name, just an email, but thank you very much. <laughs> uh, apart whoever, from that, whoever, whoever you are. Whoever you are, thanks very much, the anonymous donor. But we've also got as a new sponsor, Jose Pascual Jimeno Marí. Ángel Clavijo Martínez. And thank you to Enrique Gonzalvo for increasing your Patreon amount. Very generous. And Ricardo González, who asks, Do I need to live in an English-speaking country to be fluent in English? No. Is the answer, really, isn't it? Simple as that, no. 
It would help, but it's not essential. And you'll learn English very quickly if you go and live in an English-speaking country. But no, you can be fluent by doing a lot of listening in your country and also connecting on the internet and speaking with people through the internet. No, you do not have to move. But obviously, if you do live in an English-speaking country, you're going to learn much quicker because you're living and experiencing English every day. We also want to say thank you to our gold sponsor this month, Gabitel Ingenieros. What do they do? Well, they're involved in many areas of engineering, but perhaps of interest to you is that they are currently working on an important project in the UK for laying down, that means installing, to lay down, to install, fiber optic cable. If you would like to join their team and work in the UK, they are accepting job applications right now. To apply, you must have pre-settled or settled status in the UK. If you don't know what that means, we explain it fully in episode 342 about Brexit. But if you're hearing those words and you know, oh yes, I have that, or I know what that is, then you are in a good position to apply for this job. So pre-settled or settled status. If you have that status and you want to work for a growing, expanding company, send your CV, your curriculum vitae, or in American English, your resume, <laughs> send your CV to seleccion at gabitelingenieros.com. Now, don't worry if you're driving, if you're riding a bicycle, if you don't have a pen at the moment, you can't write that down, don't worry. The email address is in the show notes at englishpodcast.com slash Three five nine, And Gabitel is also expanding in Germany. So if you have a good level of German and you're interested, send your CV to the same address, seleccion at gabitelingenieros.com. And Rosa and I would like to thank Rodrigo, Genoveva and all the good people over at gabitelingenieros.com for being a gold sponsor of the show. What's next week, Reza? Next week, we're going on a trip around Spain. Without leaving our flat. So please join us for that. Until next time, it's goodbye from me. And bye-bye from me. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later. See you later.